Russian sector of the Arctic covers one twelfth of the planet. Until recently, it was off limits to Western scientists. In spring of 1992, the first ever joint U.S.-Russian airborne mission flew aboard a Russian aircraft in the eastern Arctic to study atmospheric chemistry. The Bennett Island Project, April 1992. The project was jointly organized by the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, and the Russian Academy of Sciences. Financial support was provided by several U.S. governmental agencies, and the project was coordinated by Working Group 8 of the U.S.-Russian Bilateral Agreement. In the winter and spring, the entire Arctic appears to be blanketed with fairly serious air pollution, the so-called Arctic haze. However, airborne measurements have only been made in the western sector until now. Of greater interest was an unexplained phenomenon that had been seen over the New Siberian Islands from satellite photographs. The phenomenon appeared to be an enormous plume, sometimes hundreds of kilometers long, emanating just from Bennett Island, a small and otherwise undistinguished island in the high Arctic. For many years there had been speculation in the Western scientific literature about these plumes. The plumes were seen from satellites every couple of weeks in the winter and spring. Some scientists had hypothesized that the plumes might be caused by the release of methane from clathrate deposits under the ocean floor. If so, this would have very important implications for the greenhouse effect and global warming. To investigate the plumes at first hand and to make air pollution measurements for the first time ever from an aircraft in the Russian Arctic, we conceived this project. In our proposal, we said we have 50% chance we think are... I'm Tony Hansen, a physicist at the Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory. I've worked with NOAA and with Russian air pollution scientists for a number of years. Russ Schnell is a senior scientist at NOAA. Together with Sasha Polisar from Moscow, we put this project together in record time. We assembled some standard air pollution measuring equipment as well as special flasks for collecting air samples for methane analysis. The equipment was shipped to Nome, Alaska and loaded onto a small aircraft to be flown across the Bering Strait to the easternmost tip of Russia. We flew from Nome to Providenia, where we were met by the Russian plane and crew. Russ Schnell returned to Alaska, and I went on to Chersky, which was to be the base of operations for the next three weeks. Chersky is 200 miles north of the Arctic Circle, on the northeast coast of Russia. It was built as an air base to supply the Kolyma River region. In the summer, ocean-going ships can unload at the river port. The activities of the town's 14,000 inhabitants are centered on the airport, transporting goods and people locally as well as in and out of the region. In the past, everything had been controlled from Moscow, eight time zones away. Moscow had also decreed that the entire area was off limits to foreigners. Following the collapse of the old Soviet Union, places like Chersky found themselves suddenly very far away and on their own. Our project represented work and earnings that the Chersky Aviation Authority was glad to have. Everyone, from the commander to the aircraft technicians, were friendly and helpful. We had contracted for 100 hours of flying time on this Antonov 26 general purpose aircraft. The plane, the pilots and the crew were assigned to us 24 hours a day, seven days a week, ready to fly whenever we wanted to study Arctic pollution or if a plume appeared at Bennett Island. Our flight plan would take us 600 miles northeast from Chersky to Bennett Island. 
On the outward and return journeys, the plane would climb and descend in a sawtooth profile from sea level to 15,000 feet to study the vertical distribution of air pollutants. Our equipment arrived in Chersky in crates and boxes, but the technicians performed the complete installation, including fabricating an air inlet to pass through the aircraft door in only two days. The air inlet and the equipment were installed and we were ready to fly. We took off and headed over the frozen lowlands of the Colima River to our mysterious destination, Bennett Island. Each flight would last from six to eight hours the plane was very noisy, but the crew included a cook. Every flight he made fish soup, tea, coffee and snacks, and they all enjoyed the western cigarettes that I had brought. Finally, we reached Bennett Island. It looked exactly like any other Arctic island. We flew round and round the island, but observed nothing that suggested any hint of subsurface methane eruptions. As would be my routine on every flight to Bennett Island, I collected a number of air samples in special flasks. These were later analyzed at the NOAA laboratories in Boulder, Colorado, for any traces of excess methane. The navigator kept the aircraft to our flight plan. As we climbed and descended, the instrumentation recorded data every 10 seconds onto a laptop computer. This data was analyzed later to reconstruct vertical profiles of air temperature, condensation nuclei count, and soot particle concentration. I had brought a second computer so I could perform preliminary analyses while we were still in flight. On aircraft missions, it's important to get as much information as possible in real time, in case you need to make a decision to change the flight plan. After a six to eight hour flight, exhausted and deafened, we would land back in Chersky. Chersky was a nice town to stay in, despite the smoke from the heating plants that fed hot water to all the buildings. By Russian standards, Chersky is a comfortable place to live. Food, housing and amenities are good. In the past, this was the reward for isolation at the furthest reaches of the country. Our accommodation was like a small apartment with a kitchenette and a shower. On the days that we weren't flying, we could analyze the data, determine the exact location of the methane flask samples relative to the perimeter of Bennett Island, and my colleague Sasha Polisar could write reports for his organization back in Moscow. The most important thing for our project was that Russ Schnell could easily phone me from Alaska. He was in Anchorage, directing the AGASP program, but also watching the satellite images of Bennett Island. Doing just fine. How was your if he saw a plume, he could immediately call me, and we yeah. could take off a couple of hours later. It does cover that. Towards the end of the project, this coordination worked out almost perfectly. Russ saw a plume, the plane was ready, and we flew. We went to the airport, loaded our supplies, and took off to try to intercept a plume.
approached Bennett Island at 20,000 feet. All we saw were high clouds, nothing at the ocean surface. We descended and entered the clouds at about 10,000 feet altitude. Finally, when we got down to the surface, we could look up to see that the plume was actually a streamer of clouds forming at 10,000 feet altitude above the island. Nothing at all coming out of the ocean. No methane eruption. We had solved the mystery of the Bennett Island plume. The analysis of the flask samples showed absolutely no excess methane at all. Instead, the plume is a meteorological phenomenon. The airflow over the specific shape, the topography of Bennett Island, puts a ripple into the atmosphere that propagates upwards. Way high up, maybe 10,000 feet higher up, one layer of the atmosphere is on the verge of nucleation and cloud formation. The vertical wave injected into the bottom of the atmosphere by Bennett Island's shape can trigger cloud formation at this level and as the cloud forms, it blows away downwind. Seen from a satellite, it looks like a plume. In a sense, this was a disappointment. A methane geyser coming up through the ocean would have been a spectacular finding. But perhaps more important in the long run is the fact that we were able to make this first ever Russian-American collaborative aircraft project succeed. Chersky Aviation is looking for work. The attitude of their management is much more positive and cooperative than is typical in Moscow. The technicians are able to make any modifications that you would want in order to install equipment aboard their aircraft. They also have more modern jet planes suitable for longer range work. The pilots and crews have lifetime experience of flying under all conditions in the Arctic. Living in Chersky during a research mission is not unpleasant, and you can keep in touch with your home office. A great deal of science remains to be done in the Arctic. We now know that it is possible to collaborate effectively with Russian aircraft operators to gain access to the half of the Arctic that was previously closed. Russ Schnell and I will do whatever we can to advise and assist similar projects in the future.